Hi friends, my name is Benjamin, and today I want to tell you another chilling story. On the evening of August 29, 2014, a Friday, Christina Morris, a 23-year-old, intended to spend the night in Plano, Texas, USA. Despite her upbringing in Plano and maintaining friendships there, she had relocated to Fort Worth, Texas, with her boyfriend Hunter Foster, following his job opportunity. Christina had acclimated to life in Fort Worth and was employed at a dating service company. Over the Labor Day weekend, specifically on the Friday night, Christina Morris returned to Plano and reunited with her high school friend, Paulina Petrosky. The two had known each other during their time at Allen High School. Paulina, residing at the shops at Legacy in Plano, organized a gathering at her apartment for Christina and a few friends from Allen High School. The group, comprised mostly of acquaintances from Allen High School, gathered at Paulina's apartment at 9 p.m. Following some drinks at Paulina's apartment, around 11 p.m., a portion of the group headed to Harry's Tavern for 30 minutes before reconvening at Scruffy Duffy's. As the night progressed, the bar closed at 2 a.m., prompting some of the group to go home. However, Christina, Sabrina, Enrique, and Stephen opted to return to Paulina's apartment. On their way back, Sabrina, Enrique, and Paulina made a detour to Whataburger for some food through the drive through Back at Paulina's apartment, the group enjoyed the food from the drive through but Paulina and Stephen noticed that Christina appeared distressed. She shared that she had been texting her boyfriend Hunter throughout the night, initially hoping he would join the party, but later discovering he had gone out with friends. Despite requesting him to pick her up, Hunter ceased responding to her texts. It was now 2.12 a.m., and over the next 90 minutes, Christina sent numerous messages to Hunter without receiving a single reply. Christina's texts began by asking Hunter to come and get her, followed by inquiries about what was happening. She pleaded with him through multiple messages, informing him of her work obligations the next day, and even notifying him that she had misplaced her car keys. By 3.01 a.m., frustration set in as Hunter remained unresponsive. Christina sent him a text message expressing her disappointment, saying good night, and conveying sentiments like, you lost the best thing to ever happen to you. Shortly after, Christina sent additional text messages to inform Hunter that she was taking a taxi home and said, see ya one day. Between 3.20 a.m. and 3.48 a.m., she continued sending messages, letting Hunter know she was not angry, her phone had died, and she had found her car keys deciding to drive home. The final text from Christina to Hunter was sent at 3.48 a.m., Christina's emotional state escalated as she persistently messaged Hunter. Stephen and Paulina attempted to comfort her. Initially considering staying at Paulina's apartment for the night, Christina later changed her mind, expressing her desire to return to Fort Worth. Despite Stephen offering to drive her home the next morning, Christina insisted on going home that night. Given that she had not consumed much alcohol and had done so earlier in the evening, the others did not perceive her as too intoxicated to drive. At the same time Christina decided to leave, Enrique also made the choice to head home, expressing his intention to walk Christina to her car as he was en route to see his girlfriend. As they departed from Paulina's apartment, Stephen called Christina to check on her, as she had been crying just before leaving. She assured him she was fine and almost at her car. However, when the 30th of August arrived, Christina failed to show up for work, causing concern among her colleagues. Despite repeated attempts to contact her through text messages, calls, and social media, Christina remained unresponsive. This behavior was uncharacteristic of her, given her responsible work ethic. On her Facebook page, her colleagues noticed a post from a friend urging Christina to call them, expressing deep concern. Fearing that something might be wrong, Christina's colleagues contacted her friend, who in turn reached out to Christina's family, only to discover that they had no information about her whereabouts. Christina's parents and stepmother contacted her friends in an attempt to trace her whereabouts, learning that the last known location was Paulina's apartment. When they reached out to Enrique, he informed them that he left with Christina, but they went their separate ways on the sidewalk. 
Enrique mentioned that Cristina was on the phone when he parted ways with her, but he didn't know who she was speaking to. Concerned about her well-being, Cristina's parents reported her as missing. In the course of the investigation, the police interviewed Hunter. Initially uncooperative, Hunter hesitated to provide his cell phone to the police. Eventually agreeing to hand it over, he did so reluctantly and only after deleting certain text messages. Hunter informed the police that he was not at home on the Friday night in question. Instead, he claimed to have been at a bar named The Concrete Cowboy in Dallas. While acknowledging that he received multiple text messages from Christina that night, he asserted that he didn't read them and wasn't actively checking his phone. According to Hunter, he only returned home on Saturday morning, around 10 a.m. or 11 a.m., to find Christina absent. Assuming she was upset and staying with friends, he didn't express concern. On Saturday night, still without any word from Christina, he went out with friends again. Hunter claimed he only became worried when Christina's father contacted him on Sunday to inquire about her whereabouts. Contrary to Hunter's version, some of Christina's friends and her father suggested to the police that Hunter might be involved in prohibited substances, use, or distribution. Hunter admitted to the police that on the night of August 29th, he was both selling and using prohibited substances in addition to consuming alcohol. When the bar closed at 2 a.m., Hunter stated that he went to the W Hotel with friends. When asked if he went to Plano that night, Hunter denied it but acknowledged that the events of the night were somewhat hazy. Despite the suspicions surrounding Hunter's account of the Friday night, the police had to methodically verify and corroborate the information provided. Despite the suspicions about Hunter and a potential connection to Christina's disappearance, there was no concrete evidence suggesting harm had befallen her or that he was involved. As part of their investigation, the police visited the parking garage where Christina had left her car on that Friday night. Christina and the group from Paulina's apartment had all parked their cars at Harry's Tavern's parking garage. There, they found Christina's Toyota Celica still securely locked. No signs of a struggle or any evidence indicating foul play were discovered in the parking garage. In an effort to piece together the events, the police obtained surveillance footage from the area. The parking garage's security camera footage revealed Christina and Enrique entering together at 3.55 a.m. on August 30th. However, just two minutes later, Enrique's car was seen backing out from its parking space, leaving the garage at 3.58 a.m. Unfortunately, the footage did not capture Christina or her car departing from the parking garage. In their conversation with Enrique, he informed the police that he left Paulina's apartment with Christina, and they parted ways at the end of the apartment complex because, according to Enrique, their cars were parked in different parking garages. Enrique explained to the police that when he last saw Christina, she was engaged in a phone call with someone. However, Enrique claimed he had no further details as he had called his girlfriend at that time. When the police requested to examine his phone log to confirm the timeline, Enrique stated that he was sending text messages to his girlfriend and was not actually speaking to her on the phone. When the police asked to review these text messages, Enrique explained that it wasn't possible because his phone was configured to automatically delete older messages. Upon reviewing Enrique's cell phone records, the police discovered that he had sent a text message to his girlfriend on the night of August 29th at 8.02 p.m., engaging in a brief exchange. At 10.38 p.m., his girlfriend requested a call, and Enrique responded at 10.41 p.m., stating he was sleepy. Despite his girlfriend believing he was at home in bed, Enrique was actually at Paulina's apartment during that time. The next text his girlfriend received from him was the following morning at 10.52 a.m. During further questioning, Enrique claimed not to know where Christina had parked her car. However, surveillance footage contradicted his statement, showing him entering the parking garage at the beginning of the night, with his car positioned one space across and one space over from Christina's. When asked if Christina had been in his car, Enrique insisted she had never been inside. He asserted that he left the shops at Legacy and drove home on Highway 75, 
which conflicted with toll road and cell phone records, indicating he followed the Dallas North Tollway to Highway 121, passing through the Highway 121 toll gantry at 4.08 a.m. When confronted with the footage of him entering the same parking garage as Christina, Enrique claimed his intoxication was so severe that he couldn't remember where he had parked his car that night. In the absence of information on Christina's whereabouts, the police, at the conclusion of their investigation, believed they had enough evidence to charge Enrique with aggravated kidnapping. Christina remained missing during his arrest and trial, and Enrique entered a plea of not guilty. The prosecution built their case around five key elements. First, Enrique was the last known person to see Christina that night. Second, Enrique's car had damage on the front of the car and the car was thoroughly cleaned. Third, Enrique's injuries. Fourth, cell phone data. Their cell's phones pinged off of the same cell towers. Fifth, Christina's DNA found on Matt in trunk of Enrique's car. The jury was informed that Enrique and Christina walked to the parking garage together after leaving Paulina's apartment around 3.55 a.m. Their cars were parked next to each other, and the prosecution theorized that the kidnapping occurred either inside the garage or at a subsequent point. The prosecution suggested that Enrique may have intentionally or accidentally harmed Christina in the garage, possibly placing her in the trunk. They proposed that Enrique then drove out of the parking garage with Christina in the trunk, or she may have initially accepted a ride, but changed her mind later. Surveillance footage from the parking garage was presented as evidence, contradicting Enrique's initial account to the police that they went separate ways. The recorded footage indicated that a solitary car departed from the parking garage a few minutes later, and no other individual was observed leaving during the subsequent 20 or 30 minutes. During the trial, it was disclosed that Enrique was scheduled to commence work at 8 a.m. on that Saturday morning, yet he only arrived at 10.51 a.m. According to a colleague, he appeared to be somewhat hungover from the night before and appeared disheveled, I suppose. The co-worker recounted that Enrique exhibited bruises and scratches on his arm, along with a noticeable limp. Additionally, the co-worker observed what he believed to be a bite mark on the inner part of Enrique's forearm. Enrique claimed to have been involved in a fight at the shops at Legacy, stating that the person he was grappling with had bitten him during a chokehold. However, Enrique later altered his account, informing his co-worker later in the week that a tire rim had fallen on his hand while attempting to rotate his car's tires, resulting in the marks. Enrique's girlfriend provided testimony stating that when she saw him on Saturday evening, she noticed an injury on his right hand along with cuts on his hand and knuckles. During the court proceedings, Sabrina Boss testified that she perceived Enrique to be romantically interested in her that night. He appeared upset when she chose to lie down on a bed instead of sitting beside him on the couch. In response, he stated, Fine, I'll just go home. And she interpreted his tone at that moment as angry. Enrique left, and when Christina was leaving as well, he offered to walk her to her car. Stephen Nickerson presented evidence, recounting that he called Christina after she departed from the apartment. She informed him she was almost at her car and sounded fine. She promised to text him upon reaching her car, but did not follow through. He texted her a few minutes later to inquire if she had made it to her car, receiving no reply. Despite calling her multiple times, all calls went to voicemail. The next day, his call again went unanswered. The prosecution introduced security camera footage from the Kroger gas station as evidence. The footage depicted Enrique using a rag to clean the passenger side of the car, followed by cleaning the trunk area and putting the car through a wash on September 3rd. In his trash, police discovered a bottle of odor remover, a multi-purpose cleaner, an all-purpose cleaner, as well as paper towels and rags. The prosecution presented evidence concerning the cell phones, contending that Christina's and Enrique's devices connected to the same cell towers when Enrique departed the parking garage. It was disclosed in court that Christina's phone pinged off the Spring Creek Boulevard cell tower at 3.46 a.m. on August 30th, and Enrique's phone pinged off the same tower at 3.57 a.m. 
Both phones also pinged off the cell tower at 5,800 Granite Parkway within a few minutes of each other, and later they pinged off a tower located on East Bethany Drive near Enrique's residence on Harvard Lane in Allen. Details about Enrique's car, a 2010 gray Camaro, were presented in court. A dent was identified on the front passenger side, specifically on the right front fender. When the police searched the car, they found that the interior, particularly the front passenger side floorboard, had been recently vacuumed and cleaned. However, what drew significant attention was the remarkably clean condition underneath the car. An accident investigator provided testimony regarding the damage on the car, stating that it appeared consistent with a soft impact, possibly involving areas like the body, the buttocks, the hips, maybe a head. The jury received information on DNA evidence, with NTHSC DNA analyst Christina Capt swabbing areas of the trunk mat from Enrique's car that reacted with Blue Star. Two DNA profiles were extracted, both matching Christina's DNA profile. Capt clarified that the DNA found was more likely to be a significant source, such as a bodily fluid. The defense presented its case emphasizing four main arguments to challenge the perceived weakness of the prosecution's case. First, injuries. Second, DNA. Third, other suspects. Fourth, cell phone data, L. Regarding the prosecution's assertion of a bite mark on Enrique's arm after Christina went missing, the defense called forensic dentist Dr. Paula Brumit to testify. After examining photos of Enrique's injuries, Dr. Brumit expressed the opinion that the marks and scratches were not indicative of bite marks. Christy Wilson, the evidence supervisor for the Plano Police Department, testified that when the trunk mat was removed from Enrique's car, it was placed in a box. However, the box was too large for the evidence locker, so it was closed as best as possible but left unsealed for three days, an acknowledged breach of protocol. The defense sought to cast doubt on the reliability of the DNA evidence, suggesting that the unsealed condition of the trunk mat may have compromised its integrity. They also raised the possibility that DNA could have been transferred by the person who examined Christina's car before Enrique's. To support the argument that there were alternative lines of inquiry, the defense called Laterence Dunbar to testify. He was a private security contractor who claimed to have met Christina at a nightclub in Uptown around August 22nd or 23rd, where she became quiet in the presence of Hunter Foster. Hunter Foster, who was serving a 33-month sentence for conspiracy to distribute MDMA, testified at the trial. It was revealed that he had sold prohibited substances to an undercover federal officer on the night of August 29th, 2014. His cell phone records indicated a call from Enrique's phone at 3.50 a.m. on August 30th, with a message asking for an ounce of a substance described as, of that good rock. Detective Robin Busby suggested that this conversation was possibly related to prohibited substances. However, it could not be determined whether Enrique or Christina was using the phone at the time. Witnesses from Paulina's apartment confirmed that Christina's phone had a low battery when she left that night. The defense argued to the jury that, despite the absence of surveillance footage showing Christina leaving the parking garage, it was plausible that she could have left by other means. The police acknowledged the possibility of someone leaving on foot without being recorded. Regarding cell phone data, the defense presented a specialist in cell phone forensics and cell tower data analysis. He testified that records for both Enrique's and Christina's phones indicated that after 4 a.m., they were only making data connections with the cell towers. He stressed that data connections were the least reliable method for determining a cell phone's location, and it was not possible to determine the likely location of the phones based on this information. Despite the defense's arguments, Enrique was found guilty of aggravated kidnapping and sentenced to life in prison, with parole eligibility in 2046. Almost two years after Enrique's conviction, remains were found in a wooded area of Anna, Texas, and were identified as belonging to Christina. The remains were found by excavators and construction workers who were clearing the area. To date, 
No murder charges have been brought. What do you think about this story? Share your opinions in the comments. Thanks for watching and for being with us. Take care of yourself and your loved ones.